What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of the video in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into another mafia topic. On March 13th, 2019, Gambino heavyweight Frank Cali was found shot six times and dead in front of his Staten Island home. The mob world wondered who the hell would kill Frank Cali. Today, we're going to break down the bizarre murder. Who did it? And why didn't the Gambino crime family do anything about it? The story of Frank Cali and his bizarre demise next. On sit down shorts. Frank Kelly was born in 1965 in the New York borough of Brooklyn. He grew up in Bensonhurst, and his family was actually connected to the mafia. It was alleged that Frank Kelly's father would actually run a household goods service in his native Sicily, and his family would come over where he would run a video store in Bensonhurst. It was alleged that at one point he was connected to multiple heroin traffickers in not only the Sicilian mafia, but in the New York mafia. And for Frank Cali, he would come up under the mentorship of Gambino, heavyweight and friend of John Gotti, Jackie Knows D'Amica. Now, Jackie Knows throughout the 80s and into the 90s would run a crew on 18th Avenue in Bensonhurst in Brooklyn. Now, for Frank Cali, he would very quickly get into very much legitimate business. Now, as any good mobster is, he would also be involved in illicit and illegal activities as well. Frank Kelly would have many legit businesses, including import-export businesses. He ran an Italian store and had fruit businesses. At one point, Frank Kelly was actually integral in the 18th Avenue Feast held in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, every year. He controlled vendors, rides, and other amusements. And it was alleged at one point he was bringing in large amounts of money for the family in these businesses. It was also talked about that Mr. Cali had many video and joker poker machines throughout social clubs and bars in Brooklyn. And according to former Gambino capo Michael D. Leonardo, he would talk about that Frank Cali was actually very involved in a telephone card scheme with Jackie Knows D'Amico and other members of the Gambino crime family in the 90s. At one point, it was ID'd by Italian police that Frank Cali was a man of honor in the Sicilian mafia. Ultimately, he would marry a woman called Rosina Inzarillo, sister of Pietro Tall Pete Inzarillo, seen here in a government surveillance photo with Frank Cali. It was very much known. Frank Cali was very integral in not only the mob here in America for the Gambino crime family, but also was very integral in Sicily. At one point, in a conversation between Sicilian mob associates in Italian, these individuals would say, quote, about Cali, he's our everything over there. Now, Frank Cali was also integral in the very known mob tactic of extortion. At one point, he began with another mob associate, Lenny Di Maria, extorting an individual called Joseph Valaro. Now, Valaro was integral in truck dumping of dirt in Staten Island and throughout New York. In fact, he was one of the main fill operators of a trucking service called Andrews Trucking in Staten Island. And for Cali and Lenny Di Maria, they would find out that by extorting Mr. Valaro, they could corner the trucking business on large scale construction operations, including the operation of creating a NASCAR track in Staten Island, hotel operations and construction and other mob businesses. This is where the money was for the Gambino crime family. Now, the sad thing and the bad thing for Frank Cali was eventually 
Joseph Valaro, who owned this trucking company, started getting involved with drug trafficking. He would eventually be caught with two keys of cocaine, and we began cooperating with the federal government. Joe Valero would flip and begin recording members of the Gambino crime family. In 2008, not only would Frank Cali be arrested, but so would Lenny Di Maria, Gambino boss Dominic Cefalu, and Jackie Knows D'Amico in an operation that the feds would call Operation Old Bridge. We would also discuss this in a previous video involving the Carneglia brothers. Now, for Frank Cali, he would have to face the facts that he was involved in an extortion attempt. And in 2009, or sorry, in 2008, Mr. Cali would ultimately plead guilty to this and would spend 16 months in federal prison. Now, up until his demise in 2019, Frank Cali would ultimately make his ascent higher and higher up in the Gambino crime family. He would at one point purchase a home in the very trendy area of Tote Hill in Staten Island. By 2015, the federal government and various news agencies would report that Frank Cali was the new street boss of the Gambino crime family. Many would ID him as, quote, a mover, a shaker, a great earner. He was not greedy. He would make people partners instead of ostracizing them. It was also confirmed that Frank Cali understood mob vision. He was mild-mannered. He was very connected in Sicily and, again, exuded boss leadership qualities. During his demise, was he the official boss of the Gambino crime family? I don't believe so. But it's important to mention Mr. Cali at the time of his murder was one of the most integral people in this country involving the mafia. That's why this murder was so big. Now, for mob historians like myself, that day in 2019 was a big one. The question was, who killed Frank Cali? Now, sadly, news agencies like the Daily Mail and the New York Daily News report that this may be a power struggle involving the news' favorite five-letter last name in the mafia. They would come up with ridiculous uh, uh, reports that Gene Gotti was involved. And sadly, nowadays in news, it's not about who's right, but who's first. The New York Daily News should be ashamed of itself for their crusade. Look, the Gottis are positive in some people's eyes, but they are mostly negative. But to create false news reports was absolutely deplorable. Let's get in to what actually happened involving Frank Cali. Now, I'm going to get into what actually happened on that day in March, but I want to give a little background on the alleged shooter of Frank Cali, an individual called Anthony Comello. Now, Mr. Comello was born in 1994. He would grow up in the Italian neighborhood of Eltingville in Staten Island. Now, for Camello, he would actually graduate high school in 2012 from Tottenville High School in Staten Island. He would live in a nondescript, very nice home on a quiet, quaint street in Eltingville. Now, for Camello, during his high school career, he was called uh, someone that was just like any other high schooler. He would hang out with a group of people. He was a normal good kid who would actually enroll in a program uh, involving construction that allowed high schoolers to make inroads into getting union jobs subsequently after their graduation. So it was clear that Mr. Camello at one point maybe wanted to get into construction or union uh, job uh, titles. At one point, though, for Anthony Camello after his graduation, he would delve in, like many, to the world of narcotics. And at one point began smoking weed. He would start taking cocaine at certain points and was developing addictions. He also would tell investigators at one point he would actually start frequenting strip clubs. He would also uh, at one point discuss that he'd actually contracted HIV from a stripper after he began uh, going to strip clubs. And at one point was seen violently vomiting. And 
he was said that he took HIV medication. It's important to remember that because he will discuss that during his interrogation. Around the 2015, 2016 time, his family would say that he began his obsession into politics, particularly into the 2016 campaign of businessman Donald Trump. It was also talked about that during that point, Mr. Camello began an obsession into his allegiance into the right wing QAnon conspiracy. Now, I'm not going to get into what QAnon is. But basically, they believe that the federal government is run by a shadowy group of deep state uh, notorious individuals. And basically, they make all the decisions and that certain members of the public are part of the deep state and they are the ones that actually run the country. And their goal is to remove Donald Trump from power. Now, Mr. Camillo began exuding many wild and bizarre beliefs involving his allegiance to QAnon. He would say that at one point he had sensitive info that multiple members of government and politics and celebrities were connected to Q and that he felt that he believed that he had police protection and presidential protection from Donald Trump himself. In February of 2019, Mr. Camello would actually intend at Gracie Mansion to arrest Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York. In fact, he had had been found with handcuffs on his person when he was detained during the citizen's arrest. Several weeks later, he would appear in Manhattan after he heard that California representatives Adam Schiff and Maxine Waters were in New York. He also intended to place those individuals under citizen's arrest as well. So this guy continued, Mr. Camello, to exude all sorts of wild and bizarre conspiracy theories. Several weeks later, on March 13, 2019, Mr. Camello would drive to an area in Staten Island called Hilltop Terrace. He would tell police investigators that he went to that secluded area to smoke marijuana and kind of stay out of the way. At that point, he happened to back in to the Cadillac Escalade of Frank Cali. Now, again, this is something that was confirmed by video surveillance that day. Mr. Camello backs in to the Escalade of Mr. Cali. Mr. Camello proceeds to get out of his truck and walk to the door of Mr. Cali. He would knock and basically say, hey, sadly, I hit your Escalade. Mr. Cali would willingly walk outside with no one else. They would shake hands and have a conversation. At one point, Mr. Camello makes the statement that he also had intended to place Mr. Cali under citizen's arrest. He believed Mr. Cali was a deep state member and was also like Miss Waters and Mr. Schiff intending to try to remove Donald Trump from power. This is the kind of deluded thinking that Mr. Camello exuded. At that point, he told investigators that Mr. Cali began to be uh, very confrontational, saying, quote, what the fuck? Are you kidding me? You don't know who I am. I could have you killed. You're lucky I don't kill you right here and now. Mr. Camello would then say he began believing that Mr. Cali was reaching toward his waistband. At that point, he went into his truck and pulled out a gun and shot Mr. Cali multiple times. Now, again, I'm just getting into what was seen on video surveillance. We're going to get into what he would tell investigators when he was arrested. Ultimately, Mr. Camello would leave the scene and on three days later, he surrendered at a home in Brick, New Jersey. Now, during the arrest of Mr. Camello, one of the police in that area would talk about that as they placed Mr. Camello in handcuffs and was placed in the back of the car, Mr. Camello would ask a police officer, quote, do you watch Fox News? He began agitatively to talk about the paranoia he had at the eyes in the sky pertaining to the helicopters that were overhead during the arrest. He would also make rambling, incoherent statements about QAnon 
and other conspiracies. Now, upon his arrival at police interrogation, it was alleged that in the truck and on the person of Anthony Camel, he would actually have handcuffs on him and that he intended to arrest Mr. Cowley and deliver him to, quote, military personnel, whatever that meant. He also would describe in his police interrogation that he was, quote, scared, jumpy, and high, and believed that Callie had a gun, and that was the reason that he shot Mr. Callie. Now, he also would say, quote, I would never do something malicious like that in terms of killing Callie. So his intention initially was to say that it was self-defense. He probably knew at that point somewhat of who Mr. Callie was. Now, I want to discuss one hypothetical thought that Mr. Camello was engaged in some sort of relationship with the niece of Frank Callie. Okay. I want to make it clear. It has become more and more clear that that is completely false. In fact, during the interrogation of Mr. Camello, Mr. Camello would be asked about his relationship or unwitting relationship with Mr. Callie's niece. At that point, Camelo would respond, quote, I don't know who the fuck his niece is. When did that happen? So investigators would believe that that was basically a dead end and that they, prior to this relationship and this interaction, Mr. Camelo and Mr. Cali did not know of each other whatsoever. Now, Mr. Camelo would make these statements that, you know, he was scared and he was jumpy and he intended self-defense. Now, He would also discuss, though, a bizarre uh, other reason as to why maybe he had killed Frank Cali. And this is where he starts to get into some really incoherent thinking, as well as obviously his connection and allegiance to QAnon. Mr. Camello would say as well that the reason he may have killed Frank Cali was, quote, that he was blackmailed into killing Cali after two identified mobsters contacted him and said, that if he did not kill Mr. Callie, that they would out his HIV status and that how he uh, contracted HIV. The police would then ask him what two mobsters asked him to do that, where Mr. Camello responded, quote, I'm no rat. Now, again, this was ultimately proven to generally be uh, just an incoherent statement. And this is where I believe Mr. Camello was smarter than people think he is. I think he started to believe that he probably couldn't beat this charge and that he already had some incoherent, unfit to stand trial uh, characteristics and that maybe this is where he could say sorts of things like that. He would also say at one point uh, he would discuss um, and be seen with the word MAGA forever on his hand. And ultimately, when he went to his first appearance, he could be seen here with the word Uh, MAGA Forever and Q written on his hand, which he would make very visible to uh, the media at that time. So there was all sorts of randomness involved in his incoherent statements. Now, my opinion of Mr. Camello is that he knew the kind of things that he was involved in. And probably my opinion is he probably went to the residence of Mr. Cali in belief that he was actually doing justice for America and attempting to arrest Mr. Callie. At that point, Mr. Callie believed that this guy is probably not all there. Something ensued and Mr. Camello shot Callie. I do not believe he intended to go there to kill Mr. Callie. And that would be kind of defined in the fact that why if he was to go there to kill Mr. Callie and had the intent in a murder one to kill Mr. Callie, why would he have handcuffs in his pocket. It wouldn't make any sense. Why would he, what would he torture him? Of course not. He intended, his belief was Mr. Cali was involved in the deep state. And then I think he just hoped that Mr. Cali would willingly go with him, which ended up not being true. I do think he was high and I think he killed him out of sheer being scared. I think that's absolutely true. Now, ultimately for Mr. Camello uh, in 2020, he was deemed mentally unfit to stand trial and he remains currently in a state mental facility. Now, the Gambino crime family in the 60s or 70s, Mr. Camello would have been killed in prison. It's very simple. Um, But this really orchestrates the continued illusion that the mob is still around. Are they still around? Absolutely. Are they somewhat powerful? Sure. Do they make money? Sure. But again, this really continues to orchestrate 
the mob's inability to maintain a real foothold into real power, i.e. politicians, police, things of that nature. In different times, Mr. Camella would have been killed. It would have been made to look like a suicide, kind of like people like, like Luciano used to do back in the day. But this continues to really illustrate, for as powerful as Frank Cali was, Mr. Camella will continue to remain uh, upright. And until his medical demise and his real uh, natural cause demise, he likely will remain free of any vengeance from the Gambino crime family. I do want to orchestrate that point. The mob is in a different time. They just can't go out and kill people. It just doesn't work like that anymore. They don't have that clout. They don't have that ability. It is important to say, though, Mr. Cali was an incredibly important person in the Gambino crime family. And this really just continues to also point home. Why did Mr. Cali willingly walk out with someone like Mr. Cal or with like Mr. Camello? We have to remember, would Carlo Gambino do this sort of thing in the 60s or 70s? Would he willingly walk out with some citizen? Of course not. He would have ordered a bodyguard or something to do it. Um, this is letting your guard down. And it's just something that wouldn't happen years ago. I do want to end this on a note involving Mr. Callie. Mr. Callie is survived by a wife and three sons. Those three sons will grow up without their father. Again, these are mobsters. And in the end, generally their demise is greatly exaggerated and it's in a hail of bullets. Sadly, though, for Mr. Callie, he died at the hands of a visible lunatic that just wasn't all there mentally. Um, we have to end up this in saying we pray for his family and may he rest in peace. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comments below.